Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's education movers, shakers, and reformers. Interviews with people who have special insights into education from preschool all the way to adult education. I'm Jim Sean, your host. We're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, also posted later on YouTube and the Hawaii Educational Policy Center. Today's guest is a principal of a Hawaiian language immersion school, Olani Lili, principal of Kao Meki Kaeo. Yes. Aloha. Uh, welcome to the show. Aloha. Mahalo for having me. Yes. Uh, and so the um, uh, you are located in Keokaha. Keokaha, part of Hilo, sort of. Yes. yes but not you know. <laughs> on the coastline. On the coastline. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, and we always begin by asking, tell me about your education. My education, well, I went to um, a public school. Uh -huh. I went to Kalahel, I graduated from Kalahel, and then I went to Windward Community College. Uh -huh. And then I went on to the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh -huh. where I got my bachelor's in um, political science and Hawaiian studies. Uh -huh. And then I went uh, to do public administration um, at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So you've been, you're now principal yes. of this interesting, different <laughs> kind of school. Yes. Take us back to the days of yore when this school <laughs> was born, really. Yeah. yeah. It actually was born one of the first Hawaiian language immersion schools in the DOE system in Hawaii. There were two uh, um, back in 1987. 87? Yeah. That's a long time. Yeah, ago. it is. It was, the first one was in Keokaha and the other one was on Oahu mm -hmm. at Waiau. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I believe uh, the reason why Keokaha was chosen is because it is a predominantly Native Hawaiian community mm -hmm. because it in it rests um, a very old, one of the first Hawaiian homestead communities. Uh -huh. So, uh, and, and uh, was this school part of a regular DOE school that spun off? Yes, so we actually started as what they call a Kula Kayapuni, mm -hmm. which was a school, I guess a school within a school, uh -huh. um, and we were under the Keoka Elementary School, mm -hmm. um, and then when the charter school law came into action, the teachers decided and the parents mm -hmm. decided um, that they wanted to change into a charter school. Uh, so this is about 2001 area. Yes, yes. Yeah. So what, what went into that decision? What w I mean, it's funded differently. Yes. Many assert with less money. <laughs> yes. Uh, but you're still on that campus. Mm -hmm. uh, what well, What was that impetus? Was it was it part of a Hawaiian uh, educational movement? That yes. Was I think it was really, as a Kula Kayapuni, your principal is the homeschool principal, uh -huh. which is sort of your regular DOE school principal. And what uh -huh. the school wanted, the school community wanted more autonomy, mm -hmm. wanted to have more control over um, how it governed itself, how it spent its funds, mm -hmm. the different kinds of how it assessed itself. And mm -hmm. so it saw charter schools as a mechanism for doing that. Mm -hmm. And for Hawaiian culture and language, that must have been an interesting little challenge to mm -hmm. to start that off yeah when no one else had yeah well I think um, you know there was Kanoka Aina um, there were other schools that I think Kuka Hakalau went out into the community and uh -huh. asked um, if they wanted to become charter mm -hmm. so there was again Ku was sort of laying that um, groundwork for us mm -hmm. um, and we um, you have to be an innovator and you have to be a calculated risk taker yes. um, to be involved in the charter school movement in Hawaii. And yeah. that's exactly what the founders were. Uh -huh. And so this must have been a rather exciting time uh, moving into education mm -hmm. as a realm that is, you know, special for Hawaiian culture yes. and focus. Well, I think um, maybe what people don't understand is that it really provides an opportunity for a community, particularly the Native Hawaiian community, to build capacity mm -hmm. as well as careers in mm -hmm. education. And mm -hmm. so um, through growing through the charter school, you educate yourself on how to be an administrator. Uh -huh. You educate yourself on how to be a fiscal um, manager. Um, those are not necessarily uh, careers that are Mm, located in Keokaha. Mm -hmm. And so as a charter school, you provide the opportunity to have a career right in your own community. Ah, so you're actually creating an institution mm -hmm. with many different parts to it. Yes. That happens to be a school. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our business is definitely educating, uh -huh. um, and our business is, it's challenging. Um, mm -hmm. You don't get into, um, 
Hawaiian immersion or charter schools because you're looking for something easy to do. Uh -huh. um, it's not easy work. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're looking for that kind of work, then that's not the place for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for a place where you can innovate, where you can um, test sort of your own personal boundaries around learning and be involved in a larger movement, mm -hmm. then definitely um, Hawaiian Immersion and um, uh, charter schools is the place to be. I have heard the term Hawaii, a Hawaiian sense of learning or style mm -hmm. of learning. Was that part of the beginning of Kaomeke as um, well? Yeah, I think, well, when you think about Hawaiian Immersion, you're really Use, utilizing the language to foster values and to foster a world view. Mm -hmm. um, as Kaumeke has changed over the years, what we've done is kind of dig a little deeper into what that actually means. Mm -hmm. And what we're working with in partnership with the Edith Kanakaole Foundation and their um, Papakuma Kavalu methodology mm -hmm. is really trying to understand how do we teach keiki from preschool through 12th grade, um, ancestral skill sets, mm -hmm. such as keen observation, ability to synthesize new information, to utilize communication of scientific data through oli and moolelo, uh -huh. and to be able to adapt um, to our changing environment mm -hmm. and what those skills are required. And those are really at the essence mm -hmm. um, what uh, our um, not unique to Native Hawaiians, mm -hmm. but are at the essence the core skill sets um, mm -hmm. that our ancestors utilized. It does sound similar and overlapping to what the department calls general learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, demonstrating, communicating, yes. observing, yes. being respectful yes. of technology. Yeah, and we're thank you. We're thankful everybody is finally catching on. Yeah, we're finally <laughs> you catching know, on. <laughs> I mean, because that's you were the GLOs <laughs> before there yes. were GLOs. Yes, 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 yes. And so that's. I mean, it's interesting when you look at areas mm. around sustainability and in education. A lot of it is going back. Uh -huh. to what were sort of the key skills that you needed to be to survive mm -hmm. definitely on an island and not just survive but to thrive on an island mm -hmm. um, and those skills are we need now to move us forward into unknown future which mm -hmm. is sort of like what you're doing when you're traversing the ocean uh -huh. on, a, on a double hull canoe yeah. um, and so uh, it's what well, we're glad that now the world is coming back around and uh, recognizing those skills. I don't know if they recognize mm -hmm. that we had those skills prior to, uh -huh, uh -huh. to the, I guess you call the interruption. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so, mm -hmm. so uh, a regular school in the DOE, they've got all these English language materials. Mm -hmm. They know what a fourth grader oh, is supposed yeah. to do in language. Uh, developmental uh, research, mm -hmm. at least in an English mm -hmm. context, is there, right? right? But now you are faced with, well, what is the vocabulary yes. appropriate for a fourth grader right. or a fifth grader? Talk a little bit about that challenge. Yeah, it is, it is a great challenge. And that's what I say, why I said that if you get into Hawaiian immersion or, or charter schools, uh -huh. it's not an easy road. Yeah. But it's a road of discovery, really, and a uh -huh. road of recreation. And mm -hmm. so we've had our teachers, we've developed our own student learning expectations for grades pre-K through 12. Mm. What we value around and where we think our children to, should be as far as their vocabulary, mm -hmm. their comprehension. So at our school, we teach all subjects from grades pre-K through um, four in Olelo, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Then at fourth grade, our students begin to learn English language arts. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to that place, you really have to start to think about what does learning English language arts all the way to the eighth grade and bringing them up to grade eighth grade look like. Yes. Now, if you have a strong language, the research shows that if you have a strong first language, which would be Hawaiian, that that switch over, it only takes a couple of years. And so what we've given ourselves is between the grades of four and eight to be able to bring them up to grade level in English language mm -hmm. arts. And so we're exploring that now. But the materials in Hawaiian are mm -hmm. being created right now, still, mm -hmm through um, the Kamehameha Schools is in partnership um, to develop, uh, I guess, nonfiction materials mm -hmm. at different reading grade levels. Mm -hmm. So when you grew up, mm -hmm. did you grow up with Hawaiian as your first language? No. It wasn't, right? No. So that was a different journey. Yes. 
for you. Yes. You were learning Hawaiian as a second language. Yes, at the, at the university. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. and, and for the community you're serving, are these uh, students coming to you with Hawaiian language? No. Not at all? No. So they already kind of know English yes. anyway. Yes. That's their first language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a major what, while I think immersion schools are getting more percentage of their students with a language, a Hawaiian language background, for our school, um, our kindergarten class this year, 97% of our students are first-time Hawaiian language learners. And so kindergarten is really all about language acquisition. Uh -huh. Now we have a preschool now that is doing, that they're getting the language, like language acquisition in preschool. Uh -huh. So we're excited to see what happens in kindergarten uh -huh. when we can teach content mm -hmm. and not language acquisition. So you have a preschool. Mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't have it, would those students have access to preschool? Mm, that's, a good, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, Probably not. I, I think the the seats available for preschool students are small, and especially if you want your child to be learning Hawaiian language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the Ahapu Nanaleo has been doing a fabulous job uh -huh. with preschool and providing that preschool well, opportunity. What, what is that term you just used? The Ahapu Nanaleo. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> That's a, a it's a nest, they call it a Hawaiian language nest that starts as a preschool program okay. that started years ago. And it's so actually- it's a curriculum? Yes, it's okay. a curriculum okay. around language acquisition um, mm -hmm. and preschool skills. Mm -hmm. um, and it is both nationally and internationally renowned. Oh, okay. Really, the state of Hawaii, it would, we have amazing gems of innovation in education. Uh -huh. And I think we sit back and we take mm -hmm. them for granted. Mm -hmm. And one of those stellar programs that are both touted, both internationally and nationally and internationally, mm -hmm. is the Hawaiian Immersion Program. Um, Indians in America, Native Americans in America, yeah. um, really look to our program as the model. Yeah, I was going to ask you about um, overlaps or cross-learning mm -hmm. with uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, which I assume are going through a very similar yes. journey. Yes, yes. We're actually w way far ahead. Um, you know, I mean, just now Alaska got, uh, as far as their constitution, part of the, of the oh. Alaskan language recognized. I mean, we've had that since, like, what was it, 1978, mm -hmm. since the Constitutional Convention. Um, it's been slow moving, and definitely there are some amazing leaders in that mm -hmm. area that have now created uh, a university. So really, you can go P20. Um, and as far as with Hawaiian language, um, mm -hmm. and that our university actually has a Hawaiian language college. It's just, we're the front runner. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes we don't uh, recognize the, the relationship and the leadership mm -hmm. uh, that Hawaiian educators are playing yes. way beyond our shores. Yes. 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 And you mentioned international. There's yes. also an international dynamic mm -hmm. here. There's a, um, there is an international group around native language speakers and native language education that meet. Uh -huh. And um, Hawaii has been consistently represented and in leadership positions there as well. Uh -huh. And so um, it's just along with that and now Hawaiian chart, looking at Hawaiian culture-based education mm -hmm. and all the tenets of that, when you look at all the latest research around education, that's what's happening in those schools. Okay. And so again, uh, a leader um, around education reform and innovation. Fantastic. We're talking with Olani Lili, principal of Kaomeke Kaeo, mm -hmm. in Hawaiian Immersion Charter School. We'll be back in one minute. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Alvarez from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from 
the people who really know what's going on, uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Murray Waki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, Reformers. We're talking with Olani Lilly, principal of a Hawaiian immersion charter school on the Big Island. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to uh, wander a little bit in terms of the relationship of the Hawaiian Emergent School movement to the University of Hawaii and resources they provide. Mm -hmm. what, what, what relationship, if any, is there? Um, I think there's been an amazing relationship. I think Native Hawaiians uh, astutely, or those involved in the immersion program, astutely saw uh, the university as a resource. Mm -hmm. And so went into that and started to develop from within. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at what is happening at the University of Hawaii at Hilo mm -hmm. and the the resources it provides for um, Hawaiian immersion um, education and Hawaiian language education all the way up until P20 um, or to, you know, I guess actually graduate level and doctorate level. And then also the University of Hawaii Amanoa um, and Kalihua Krug and his work in recently in developing a Hawaiian, a, I guess a standardized assessment in the Hawaiian language uh -huh. that is not necessarily just a translation of the Smarter Balance, but actually reflects the learning that's going on in Hawaiian Immersion Schools. So we're talking about a paper test that's being sort of- Computerized, yes. Computerized mm -hmm. as well. But I assume though that there's also what some people might call authentic assessments yes. or ho'oike or yes. demonstrating uh, in a very Hawaiian traditional yes. way your skills. How does that interface with No Child Left Behind oh, yeah. and the test world? Yeah, you know? well, I mean, that's where we get into what the latest research is really showing around oh. standardized assessment okay. and really um, that standardized assessment is just a snapshot in time. Right. And uh, my true belief is that standardized assessment makes bureaucracy work easy yes. because it allows you to get a score and then to paint a picture with that score yes. that doesn't necessarily for on the school level tell you or even on policy level tell you what's working and what's not working mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you really have to dig a little deeper and so we saw that very early on um, as we were going through our accreditation process and we tried to collect student learning data mm -hmm. what we saw was that every three years the state test was changing. And so we had nothing really. So it was a moving target. It was a moving target. And you couldn't say as a school sort of where you, you know, what was working well and what wasn't working well. So all the work you might have done into translating culturally, yeah. boop. Yeah. We changed it now. Yeah. And so you don't, it just, and for, I mean, only until recently, mm -hmm. um, when we were, our students were given the HSA um, at third grade. This is the state test. The yeah. state test prior to Smarter Balance. Yeah. Um, the Hawaiian immersion students in the third grade, mm -hmm. um, every student across the state was given three chances, three testing windows to take the state standard, standardized test. Um, Hawaiian immersion students were able to take one in Hawaiian but the other two were in English. Okay. And so you weren't provided three in the Hawaiian language. Uh -huh. And so for our third graders, it was, it was a non-test. It was a non-starter. Mm -hmm. um, and just, and that's, the department finally decided to invest in creating a standardized test in Hawaiian language. Mm -hmm. Now for our school, we do a different me methodology. And so even that test doesn't necessarily measure, even mm -hmm. though they're trying to put the work into it, it's standardized. Uh -huh. So it has to, it has to address multiple mm -hmm. methods of education. So we decided to create our own assessment and we're uh -huh. busy in that work right now, which is actually an array of assessments and actually measures competency based mm -hmm. on our learner outcomes versus um, you have completed this, this is where you have to be in third grade. Uh -huh. Well, but still it seems to me that the state is interested in two, two subject matters. Yes. Not necessarily science, no. not the visual arts, no. not music, no. not hula, not yeah, not the, the breadth of, of what it means to live. Yeah, or actually any application of that knowledge. Yes. So, you know, the standardized test doesn't allow you to apply that knowledge. And that's where real uh -huh. knowledge hits the ground. Um, mm -hmm. You And that where we're seeing that 
uh, that's where authentic assessment and hoike come into play. Mm -hmm. um, so we utilize the Papaku Makavalu methodology. Can you say that again? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, Papaku Makavalu methodology, okay. which really comes from um, Antipua Kanahele and her work around the Kumulipo. Uh. And um, the Edith Kanakaole Foundation mm -hmm. um, has been providing those workshops mm -hmm. for several years. Um, we uh, look at how um, those skills can be taught from grades K through 12 mm -hmm. into, in order to create um, uh, young adults who are able to apply their learning mm -hmm. in meaningful ways within their community. Uh -huh. And so the Papaku Makavalu methodology, the skill sets, again, are ancestral skill sets, uh -huh. but now they're 21st century Yeah, and skill those skill sets. sets are listening, observing. Keen observation of the it's environment. It's kind of a science uh, approach. Is. Yes. So STEAM. Steam. Science, technology. With the arts stuck in yeah, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is, is, and I'm, again, I'm glad yeah. <laughs> that American education is finally coming around about taking away those silos between science, technology, well, engineering. Well, allegedly, and I right. don't see. This is true. Yeah. This is true. But that is, uh, that is a Hawaiian way of thinking, uh -huh, uh -huh. is that you can take an, mm -hmm. uh, an element in the environment, mm -hmm. you can deconstruct it, and then you need to, after you deconstruct it, you have to reconstruct it uh -huh. to see it in its whole and its entirety in relationship to other elements in the environment. Uh -huh. That's STEAM, uh -huh. but that's also ancestral wisdom. Yeah. So, uh, you know, many, many schools that emphasize STEM mm -hmm. tend to leave out the arts, you know, mm -hmm. because all the resources are put into that. But right. you've been able to integrate the arts we're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a work oh, in progress. Oh, okay, okay. It's a work in progress. And the arts really comes into play when you look at how our ancestors, again, I go back to our ancestral models, uh -huh. how they communicated. Mm -hmm. It was through the arts. So scientific data uh -huh. is embedded in the chants uh -huh. in the hula. So when you're watching Mary Monarch, you're watching scientific data dance across the stage. I see. Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's an art. Yes. And so we want to teach our children how to do that. Uh -huh. But also, as you're doing STEM, you don't just, it's not research for research STEM basis. STEM is science, technology, technology engineering, and math. math. Right. You don't just do research for research, purely research. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You do that to solve a problem or to mm -hmm. address an issue. Yeah. That's where the A comes in. It, yeah. It's around designing a solution to the research or the problem that you may be seeing, for mm -hmm. us in particular in our coastline mm -hmm. environment or in our watershed. Now, th there's uh, a number of um, narratives or myths about, oh, they're spending all their time learning Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't they be learning English? Mm -hmm. uh, what does the research say about uh, those two parts of our brains or whatever yeah. that, that are working at the same time? Yeah. There's a, actually a tremendous amount of research around language acquisition uh -huh. and how early language ac acquisition actually helps the synapses of a young child connect uh -huh. earlier and mm -hmm. stronger. Mm -hmm. um, we just worked with the University of Hawaii at Manoa, um, the education department, their PhD um, program to do, they were doing some community consulting and they looked at brain research and mm. its connectedness to language and the um, and Papaku Makavala's methodology. Uh -huh. And the more you use those synapses, the more you mm -hmm. connect in mm -hmm. and you use more uh, parts of your brain uh -huh. than you would normally do with just one single language. Uh -huh. I found it interesting. We were talking earlier mm -hmm. about uh, noticing climate change mm -hmm. over the years, yep. and uh, you were mentioning that students could determine by looking at the old chants mm -hmm. when the birds were arriving earlier, earlier. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, most most people probably don't see Hawaiian chants as scientific. Yeah. I know I didn't until just yeah. a couple, I mean, I just a couple years ago um, until I got to hang out with Auntie Pua mm -hmm. and, and go to a Papakuma Kavalu um, workshop. But it's, I mean, you kind of get it. You get the names, um, you get the idea about the significance of the names and how they relate to what's actually happening in that environment. Uh -huh. What our students do is there are, um, uh, our fifth, what was that, fourth grade students were students no, I'm sorry, our second grade students were studying some chants around um, the time of Lono, Makahiki, which we're in right now. Mm -hmm. And they were talking, in the part, is there's a part about a kolea and when the kolea comes. 
And then they were out at Haleolono, a fish pond. The Kalea a, is, a, is, a, is a bird. It's a bird that travels from Alaska and comes during the winter time, our winter time. Oh, I see. So it's a migratory bird. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And so it comes at certain times and it eats. And then when it gets fat, it returns back to Alaska. Oh, oh okay. um, And so there are marked times within oh. our season um, that we know that they're going to be arriving. And this year, our second graders uh, noted that they had actually arrived earlier than what the chant said and even what in previous years the data that they had collected. Oh wow, so that so the chant actually has sort of a calendar mm -hmm. built into it of what's happening. In what you should be seeing during the time of Lono, which is the time we're in now. Uh -huh. So you should be seeing more rain. Um, at the early parts you're seeing a lot of sort of sunny, rainy, mm -hmm. sunny, rainy, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, more rain, thunder, mm -hmm. winds, high surf. I mean all the things we attribute to mm -hmm. living while we live here and mm -hmm. our observations, those are documented in chants. Mm -hmm. And your school is also a laboratory school for other emerging schools. Yes. Tell, uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so because we've been doing a lot of work, um, and namely because of our previous um, uh, administrator, Hui Hui Kanahele Mossman, and her bringing on Roxanne Stewart, who's our Papaku Makavalu resource teacher, and also our partnership with the Ida's Kanaka Ole Foundation, mm -hmm. we've been um, collecting a lot of research uh, in those areas and really trying to uh, create learning expectations to figure out curriculum materials that would be appropriate, like data sheets for uh, first graders who have, for the last four years, been going out to two coastal sites mm -hmm. and been collecting data um, around what they're seeing in the environment. That all needs to be created. There's no... So you're a curriculum developer yes. for other... Uh, of the uh, immersion schools? Well, right now we did it for us, uh -huh. and then well, we, we tested it out, and then we created our own assessments, and then there were other Hawaiian immersion schools that wanted to sort of jump on that bandwagon. Uh -huh. So we have Roxanne Stewart who's been going out mm -hmm. and actually training other people in immersion schools to be able to do this uh -huh. methodology. Now, is are, are all immersion schools created equal? Do they take the same approaches? No, no. I mean, they're just as diverse, I guess you could say, as any other school. Oh. I mean, is, is the, every DOE, DOE school the same? No. no. I think what they, they it, it differs in the language and how it's used, mm -hmm. how many hours, how often um, approaches around language. So uh -huh. for us right now, a lot of our research is delving into extracting scientific vocabulary out of the chance to be used in the classroom. So we're really trying to focus our vocabulary yeah. and our language acquisition yeah. to help support the methodology that we're utilizing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure there are other uh, schools, immersion schools out there that are sort of more, they're probably their vocabulary is more specific to their place and their practice. So is there a kind of organization of immersion schools? Yes. Yes, it's the Ahakao Leo that brings together uh, immersion schools statewide. Uh, and how often does this group meet? Uh, about once a month. Once a month. Mm -hmm. So it's quite yeah. a lot, quite inter interactive. Yes, it is. And I think it's, um, it's picked up recently because of the work around the assessment uh -huh. um, and also because of uh, I guess sort of just the push when you look at where Hawaiian immersion schools fall as far as these statewide rankings. Okay, well, we're talking with Olani Lilly mm -hmm. about Hawaiian immersion schools. We'll be back in one minute. <laughs> Aloha, my name is Kaui Lucas. I am the host of Hawaii is My Mainland here every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii at 3 p.m. I invite people who are doing interesting and inspiring things in our community to help us keep it local and keep it real. Tune in any Friday, 3 p.m., and also available on our YouTube channel and my blog, kawilucas.com. Hawaii is my mainland. Aloha. Aloha. How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, asking you to come join us on Think Tech Hawaii Hibachi Talk. Join me and my two hosts, Gordo the Texar and Andrew the Security Guy, every Friday from 1245 till 1345. See you on Fridays, and remember, let your wing gang free, wherever you be. <laughs> Aloha, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Mover Shakers Reformers. 
We're talking with a real mover shaker <laughs> reformer, Olani Lilly. And uh, I wanted to get into the, initially you were talking about how you're creating institutional mm -hmm. professional jobs yes, yes. Uh, by the school, but you're also now moving into the need to build your own school yes. in association with a nonprofit. Yes. Uh, let, let's start us on that journey. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> a long journey. <laughs> it's, it's a long journey. And a, a, I mean, it requires, um, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, it, there's very little um, support around it as far as, like, you need to engage in your own capital campaign. Mm -hmm. You need to figure out how you're going to do it. You need so to the state, per se, is not going to say, here, no. go build a school. No, no, no. no. No, no, no. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, that's kind of a good thing and kind of a bad thing. I okay. mean, it, it's good and it allows us, again, I mean, we're very, we want to be innovative and we yeah. want to be independent. And so it allows us that. So you can design a school uh, yes. in ways that don't look like your strip mall, right. you know, factory. Right. right. And actually, we worked with WCIT to do our master planning. What's WCIT? They're an architectural firm oh, okay. and a design firm. And um, we had just come off of, or off of uh, Papaku Makawalu training again around um, KU and the energies of KU. Um, and so our uh, design or our layout is akin to a Lua Kini Heiau which may seem a little um, like scary to people because that's conjured as a sacrificial heiau mm -hmm. and that's what it was but within this movement we make sacrifices every day mm -hmm. of our time of our sweat of our tears um, of the lives that we you know the hours that we give to this and so what we want to do is when our students come onto this mm -hmm. this campus they know they're stepping into a place where we expect excellence and that's what a lua kini mm -hmm. is and that that excellence will be harnessed mm -hmm. for the good of the community okay so you've got to start talking with an architect yes right talking with an architect well talking with an architect and then at the same time trying to find land mm -hmm. and then um while you're finding land you know continue to engage your community so it's a lot of community development um, engage your community and what this dream would look like. You need to be researching sort of what are the latest models around educational facilities. Uh -huh. You need to understand your program uh -huh. um, to know what kind of facilities you want to create. Uh -huh. um, and then uh, once you get the land, then you need to figure out how you're going to get the money. So there's square footage, square footage. Uh, the, the vocabulary yes. of development yes. now. You're now a developer. Yes. In, 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 in a very real yeah, way. in yes. a very real way. And that you can, um, you bring a lot of money into your community. And so mm -hmm. on a previous project that I worked on where we built, did facilities, we really looked at going, um, going green um, and wanting to be at the highest level of green. Uh -huh. um, so we went for USGBC gr green building standards and yes. actually was um, the, one of the first schools in the, st or the first school in the state to get platinum certification uh -huh. um that was at kanu okaina and which, you, is, which is on the big island yes, as well in waimea and what you do is you bring a lot of money you have the potential to uh -huh. bring a lot of money into your community yeah well you mentioned something interesting uh -huh. because you were involved with a different charter school yes and so you were partly kind of trained and yes and, and primed and, hard knocks. and primed <laughs> yeah. to go on to another one so yeah. which is an important learning environment I yes. suppose yes yeah and so really I think I mean we had a really strong team um, with Kuka Kalau mm -hmm. leading um, and so really this is um, exciting for me um, it, and to be able to do this again uh -huh. will be uh, I, it'll be the real test for me mm -hmm. I think once you get you do it one time and it takes really long and you kind of don't know where you're going you can now I kind of know what the roadmap looks like mm -hmm. and that's not um, something that's normally found in education, like uh -huh. knowing that roadmap and what it is. I don't have it all worked out yet, mm -hmm. um, but this will be a next sort of test for me about my ability to accomplish that mm -hmm. with this new community. And I'm really, there are different set of challenges definitely in Keokaha because of it being locked in between the coastline and 
the airport, the, the physical, airport. physical location. Yes. Yeah, and that there is while there's lots of Hawaiian homelands, mm -hmm. it is uh, very. It's not the green pastures of Waimea, that's for sure. It, is noise going to be an issue because of the noise airport? is going to be an issue? I know uh, on on the other side of the island, right? Uh, the, air, the airport mm -hmm. is a, an issue for the charter school yes. area. Yeah, and so we um, we're actually right now looking uh, working with Kamehameha on some land. Um, but we have either the noise of um, the, the airport. airport and having to have everything being closed up in air condition yes. or being close to the coastline and mm. having um, the water features <laughs> that are close near the coastline uh. as far as like ponds and aqualine ponds um, and disturbing that as well as tsunami. Mm -hmm. So it's a challenge, but our um, school community mm -hmm. is committed to staying in Keokaha. Most of the DOE schools are over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. Same more or less design, yeah. one room after another. How will your school look differently oh my gosh. physically? Oh my, it's going to be, the dream of it is yes. going to be amazing. And yeah. um, really, it'll look like uh, like a science research center. A science research yeah. center. And uh, design yeah. development. So what does that look like? That yeah. looks like a lot of lab space. Yeah, a lot of lab space. A lot of lab space, a lot of work areas, uh -huh. more collaborative working spaces. Outside stuff? Outside, yeah. inside, yeah. all sides. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, a worker shed, a place where we can create prototyping. Uh -huh. We can do prototyping. A real place where Lononuia Keo, which is the name of our site and our mm. dream for our facilities, is really um, beyond just the charter school. It's about providing, uh, let me take a couple steps. Can oh. I take a couple steps back? Take them okay. back. <laughs> okay. So when you look at Native Hawaiians and going into STEAM fields, uh -huh. we are dismally represented in those fields, right. both at post-secondary as well as careers. And so what we were thinking was, when we really get into why is that? Because mm -hmm. we're, we are scientists, we are technology, we've always been that. Mm -hmm. So why is it? Um, and I think what we came to see is that it, we don't see it as Hawaiians as our daily living. Uh -huh. And so Lono Nui Akea will be where a kindergarten can come and can see mm -hmm. a high school student working with some real scientists, uh -huh. doing some real scientific work mm -hmm. and designing prototypes, and it'll become part of their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so then that becomes a norm. And we think if we can create that norm within the Native Hawaiian community, then we'll get more Native Hawaiians in those fields. And STEM or STEAM will, as a cool acronym, will go away, mm -hmm. but we will still be there. So you, you, you'll have intergenerational, intergenerational basic, learning, mentoring of older students to younger yes. students. Scientists, real scientists, real science okay. research happening yes. with our students, along mm -hmm. with uh, you know professional, I guess you could say professional scientists, real apps being built by oh. our students, uh -huh. um, real um, prototyping, of you know energy generating um, uh, limu products, mm -hmm. you know whatever is sort of relevant to our mm -hmm. coastline, mm -hmm. um, and also looking at how as a community we problem solve around mm -hmm. climate change mm -hmm. and what those changes are going to mean for our coastal community. It sounds like you're bringing a lot of potential value yes. to uh, an area of the island that might not have as many economic and other educational yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and um, I wonder if you think that you would be able to do it if you were in Honolulu. I, is, is it neighbor island mm. and somewhat rural? Is that a, actually an advantage? I think so. Yes. I think so. Um, it's easier to get at the, the yeah. natural environment, I guess. It's, yes. more, mm. it's more of a, a lifestyle. It's a little bit, although, you know, I think of Nu'uanu and I think of the streams and mm -hmm. I think of you know, the potential here in, t in Honolulu. And I think it's still there. Uh -huh. I think it maybe takes a little bit more work to get at it, uh -huh. but it's still there. Um, it's just easier and sort of more part of your lifestyle mm -hmm. um, living in Keokaha. And I think uh, it is definitely, um, I mean, when we look at like industries in Hawaii, I think mm -hmm. it could be a very exciting new industry around mm -hmm. education, science, research. Mm -hmm. um, and however, we do want to be at the place where we can control that. I see. 
the Big Island seems to be a hotbed of charterdom. You know, yeah, like yeah. Charter schools, there, particularly the Hilo yeah. side. Why do you think that's true? What what is what is it about the Big Island that has where this different model of uh, mm -hmm. governance and everything yeah. has taken hold more? Um, well, I think one is the distance between communities and oh, yeah. the, you know, even like when you take, for example, Puna oh. and what like Pahoa oh. and that school has to deal with and the difference within the community of just like what Pahoa, the uh -huh. DOE school has to deal with. Uh -huh. We can provide a more sort of place-based, community-based uh -huh. approach uh -huh. Uh -huh. to um, education uh -huh. um, because of the distances you have to travel in order to get to a school or within your community and the, uh -huh. the differences from one area to uh -huh. the next. I uh -huh. mean, Keokaha has definitely a different vibe than let's say like up Malka in Hilo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, so each, each section and community needs its own sort of alternative. Well, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it allows for diversity, mm -hmm. and I think it allows for innovation, mm -hmm. and it allows children to really be connected mm -hmm. to their place um, mm -hmm. instead of being bussed out someplace mm -hmm. else and be learning in that place mm -hmm. and get very intimately connected to their community. Now, recently, the Department of Education hired someone to be in charge of their uh, Hawaiian education mm -hmm. yep. uh, and somebody from the university yes. joined that. Yes. Uh, what do you expect from them in terms of support that might not have been there? We're well, waiting and seeing. You're waiting and seeing? <laughs> I know the individuals and I, yeah. I know um, uh, uh, given you know their giving nature, I'm I sure know. they will try their darndest to, <laughs> to, to provide um, whatever they can. Uh -huh. um, but we're waiting to see what the system does. Uh -huh. It does sound like other institutions, the university, Kamehameha schools, others have resources, land, mm. other kinds of things that are more directly flowing into the emerging community. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Or is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there have been efforts yeah. made in that area. I think um, uh, it's just a different different animal. I don't, mm. I don't know, sometimes I wonder if people in big institutions really mm. understand the entrepreneurial yeah. nature of mm. charter schools. Not as entrepreneurial, but really risk-taking and the amount of learning that needs to go into it, the amount of work mm -hmm. that it's really, you're dedicated. It's You're not just, I don't want to say yeah. just, you're not a typical principal. No. You are a CEO of moving parts yes. and everything else. Yeah. Yes. And I, I mean, I'm just newly a principal, yeah. and so I have much appreciation for all the principals in the world because yeah. it is a crazy job, <laughs> to say the least. But I definitely know, um, I can only imagine if, if coming up with a budget and if finances, mm -hmm. not that we would be negligent in finances and go crazy, but if finances weren't the barrier to to for us mm -hmm. um we would be so far ahead yes. um you know we would it, it would just make life a whole lot easier mm -hmm. and i'm not mm -hmm. asking for you know free money and i'm yeah. not asking to just uh sort of have spending and go crazy uh -huh. um that's not what we're asking for but um the amount of effort it takes in gearing up and being able to go out and ask and the competition that's out there mm -hmm. um it just takes away from the education mm -hmm. that's going on. Um, and again, if money was not the issue, um, we'd be so farther along. Mm -hmm. Well, Olani Lily, you are a mover, shaker, reformer. <laughs> uh, so with courage and grit <laughs> yes. and sustainability, uh, thank you for all you do. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us on the show. Mahalo. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another mover, shaker, reformer. Aloha. Thank you.